Welcome back and alive now from Fox. I'm Austin Westfall. Let's get to the latest on the Israel Hamas war. And for that, we bring in national security analyst and retired Marine intelligence officer Hal Kempfer. As always, Hal, good to see you. Let's get straight into the news. There's a lot to cover today. Sunday marks six months since Hamas attacked Israel, sparking the brutal war that's unfolded ever since. Now, when Israel declared that war, it had strong backing at home and around the world. But now things look a little bit different. Israel is intensely divided domestically. It's increasingly isolated internationally, including increased friction from its closest ally, the U.S. This all comes as fighting continues in Gaza and fear of a wider war remains. Hal, we've been discussing this war since it started, and a lot of what we've discussed has centered around the fighting itself. But narrative also plays a role in this war, too, maybe more so in the social media age. So, Hal, who is winning right now the battle of narrative? Is it Israel or is it Hamas? Austin, it's interesting you say that because actually the Hamas narrative does seem to be carrying a lot of weight in, in various places. You know, one of the biggest narratives uh, has been the uh, the loss of, uh, of, you know, casualties, if you will, uh, the total number of casualties in Gaza Strip, and then the number that are children, civilians, women. And, you know, initially when the fighting started at the beginning of the war, uh, this stuff was coming out about the casualty numbers. And, it was, and the Hamas Ministry of Health, uh, the Gaza Ministry of Health, which is a Hamas-run organization, was putting out these numbers and they were being repeated over and over again. And and Israel was able to start putting out a counter narrative. It actually even got picked up by President Biden saying that, hey, look, these I don't think these numbers are accurate. Uh, he's saying that publicly. And, and for a while, uh, for months, you did hear most of the major news networks would preface whatever was said on the casualty numbers that this is from the Hamas Ministry of Health, or these are Hamas supplied numbers, or something like that. What I've noticed in the last couple of months is that whole reference to Hamas supplying those numbers has largely disappeared uh, from a lot of the the narratives out there, and they just throw those numbers out. There's still there's still Hamas numbers. There's been some very good work, uh, analytical work done, uh, which shows that those numbers of casualties stay eerily similar day after day. They, they tend to be the same constant pattern of, of casualties, uh, regardless of how the actual uh, operational tempo is going in the war. In other words, what they're reporting as losses can't possibly match what's happening on the battlefield, so to speak. They just, they don't correlate at all. They're just, uh, they, they look like they're just numbers that are put forward as a steady increasing number. That narrative has been largely lost, and I and I don't know why uh, Israel, which is very sophisticated at information operations, very sophisticated at public information, uh, public affairs, seems to have lost the global battle, if you will, for that narrative on the and the losses. And 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 frankly, if you look at a lot of the actions being taken by the United Nations, a lot of the uh, political uh, gravitas or political pressure felt on Western leaders they're all tied back to the numbers, yet somehow uh, Israel has lost the uh, the narrative on numbers, and I think that has really hurt them over the long run. So, uh, as you've seen wars play out through your professional life, do you find that narrative and public perception are becoming more pivotal component in how nations navigate war and and how leaders make decisions? Not Not that it hasn't been pivotal already, but there's a social media piece to this now, Hal. It's, it, it's a 24 uh, seven and social media, what's, what used to be called non-traditional media, uh, has a huge impact on this. And, uh, and it's one of those, you know, we, there, there's, there's something I, I, I lecture on frequently, it's called strategic communications. And one of the things we, we mentioned with that is strategic communications is a core part of your strategy. It's not just what you do, it's how you show what you've done. It's how you explain what you've done. Because at the end of the day, um, as, as we tell, frankly, military forces around the world and, and large public organizations that deal with disaster management, at the end of the day, your report card is not what you write for yourself. Your report card is how the public and 
and and political leaders who respond to how the public uh, views what you've been doing and how you've been doing it, that's going to be ultimately the uh, the assessment on how you did. That is so important that they get that right now. I've also seen it where they, they spend all their time on propaganda, not not Israel, but I'm just saying I've seen it where countries will spend a lot of time on propaganda and there's no substance behind what they're saying they're doing. And in that in those cases, they, they will quickly discredit themselves. And I think probably what Israel has been doing is holding back a little bit because they're afraid of, of getting too far off front, maybe getting caught with that gap between what's the reality on the ground and whatever they're saying. But I think that maybe that holding back part, they should have been a little, a little more aggressive on uh, on dealing with those numbers. And and one thing I kept waiting for and waiting for, and it never happened. And it would have been an assessment, not not a ground truth, but it would have been an assessment, is for Israel to start putting out estimated numbers of casualties, what the composition was estimated to be in women and children. And I think they just decided to stay away from it because they probably decided there was no good way to present that, so they just didn't. Uh, but what that did was it presented no counter narrative to whatever Hamas was putting out. And so that's been a big problem. And and with that, that's where you have the other problem. You know, what, you know, leading up to the uh, WCK, you know, the World uh, Central Kitchens attack, which was just an absolute mess. Uh, there, there really is, there's, there's, you know, I, I know they're trying to put out an explanation for what had happened. It was just a, a, a calamity of errors at best, but I, I just, I, I find it with, with whatever's happening in the fire coordination cell uh, was a very undisciplined approach to targeting and target intelligence. And I just, I'm, I'm just stunned with how badly that went. The thing is, the reason it went so badly was because there'd been a lot of other things that looked similar that didn't necessarily involve Western uh, international uh, aid uh, workers that were that were more like, more confined to Palestinian aid workers that were in the Gaza Strip, and since that was already there, when this happened, it it basically snowballed on top of a narrative that was already out there, and that's some of what Israel's dealing with on this, is that they just did not get ahead of the power curve, if you will, on the narrative part, and so that's one of the things that kind of the, the you know those. That's one thing that's starting to settle in. When we talk about the, the narrative angle to all of this, Hal, and, and taking into account the World Central Kitchen uh, piece to this, there's there's been a number of other things that Israel has taken heat for as this war has gone on. H has Israel lost this narrative world, or, or is, uh, got, is Hamas uh, winning this narrative war, or neither? Is it something in the middle? I, I think if I was to look at it, I'd say Israel has a lot of uh, work to do to uh, regain, regain credibility and to and to get a story told better. But this is the problem Israel has. Six months of war have gone by. And uh, it's, it's, you know, you can say what you're doing and you can initially explain it, but at some point, whatever you're doing becomes fairly apparent uh, to a lot of different organizations and agencies and stuff. Uh, around the world, uh, not the least of which the United Nations, among others. And so uh, whatever they put out as their narrative now is going to compete with not just the the narrative of Hamas, but the but a narrative of Hamas that's been accepted by a number of countries around the world. and And even here in the United States, we're starting to hear that more people are are being swayed by this view of how that war is being conducted. And that's part of what you saw with what happened with that phone call this week between uh, Biden and Netanyahu is uh, this frustration with the conduct of the war. So uh, uh, part of it's a narrative, uh, but I will say the narrative has to match reality on the ground. And there has to be a lot of things done substantively on the ground. And at this point, I'd say if, if Israel wants to turn around, they're going to have to do a lot of big things on the ground to really change the perception of how they're conducting this war. And of course, the biggest thing is is the humanitarian side, which is, you know, protecting civilians, but also, you know, they need to not just increase the amount of aid; they need to exponentially increase the amount of aid uh, going into uh, Gaza. And there's a lot of things that I, that that they're not talked about that should have been done that weren't done. For example, building refugee uh, cities, if you will, 
where there's clean water, sanitation, food for all these displaced persons. Humanitarian uh, islands. It never something. happened. It just never happened. Yeah, if you recall, Hal, I remember the IDF saying that they had this plan for humanitarian islands at some point, but maybe you've heard something about this. I have not heard any update on how exactly they're going to carry that out. Does it seem like they have a plan? I, I, if it's a plan, it's just a plan. I, I haven't seen anything moving on the ground. Now, if there's something where they're building something out, if they're actually doing something, and it's just something that, that, that hasn't been seen, I'd like to know. But I, but today, the reality is there is so much uh, what we call open source intelligence, uh, so much commercial satellite imagery, that if they were doing something like that in the Gaza Strip, I, I think it would be known immediately to everybody around the world. All the all the major news agencies uh, subscribe to uh, satellite imagery uh, services. And so if they were building these islands, uh, as they call it, we would have seen that and, and we would know about it. And that'd be that would be a big part of the discussion uh, of what Israel's doing. So let, let's move on. Uh, let's look ahead here. You know, obviously this past six months has, there's been a lot to cover. There's been a lot to follow and, and there is still much more to come. I want to pull up this tweet. So Iran has reportedly put its military forces on, quote, full high alert as it vows revenge for a strike on Monday that killed a top Iranian commander in Syria and several other Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps members. Two Iranian officials quoted Friday by the New York Times said that Iran has made a decision to directly attack Israel. I want to focus on the words directly attack, Hal, because during this war, we've become accustomed to Iran attacking through its proxies like Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis. Do we know what a direct attack means? Could this be an attack from Iran proper? Uh, it could potentially be. Uh, they do have uh, capabilities. Uh, for example, they could use drones and missiles to attack uh, Israeli diplomatic sites. Uh, now, in the Persian Gulf, for example, uh, because Israel does have uh, embassies in the Persian Gulf, so they could they could attack those sites. They, they could also attack uh, what they think are uh, business interests that are tied to Israel. Uh, have you seen with the Houthis? That's not a very exact science. They seem to attack just about every ship that goes by, and most of them that they attack have absolutely nothing to do with Israel, though that's their, their claimed rationale for attacking them. Uh, so they could do that. They could also uh, launch uh, terrorist attacks uh, directly. In fact, they could actually use their own operatives. Uh, they could use Al-Quds Force operatives to actually conduct terrorist attacks in Europe, North America, or elsewhere around the world. That's within their capability set. And, uh, and, and they also can use Hezbollah, which is their proxy. And maybe in, in what they're saying with directly attack, that they may not mean that it, it, you know, as, as we would interpret that, they may mean that they're going to order one of their proxies like Hezbollah to directly attack. And, and recall that Hezbollah in, in, in Lebanon has somewhere between 130 and 150,000 missiles. And they could uh, overwhelm the uh, Iron Dome air defense system in Israel and, and just rain a tremendous amount uh, of, of damage, of, uh, of destructive force onto uh, throughout Israel, onto all of its cities, uh, causing a major devastation and, and, and certainly major setbacks uh, for Israel as a whole. So that's another thing they could do. Now, Hezbollah has been kind of dragging its feet, and Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah up there, has been kind of dragging his feet. He does some things that he has, he feels he has to do to show that he's sort of, uh, you know, confronting Israel, uh, I think more for his, uh, his own uh, domestic base, if you will. but they haven't really crossed that line. They know that if they cross that line, there's a very good chance they may be at, at war with Israel, and that would be the end of Hezbollah. Uh, not without some cost to Israel, but it would be the end of Hezbollah. So there's a lot of options they could do uh, in that regard, and they could try and do stuff with the Houthis. Interestingly, though, here's the news story that, that is the non-story, which I think is one of the biggest stories. Have you noticed the last few days there have not been a whole lot of Houthi attacks? It's I, fallen off precipitously. And there are reports coming out that the Houthis may have expended uh, most of their drones and missiles, and they're now having to hold back because they don't get, they're not getting resupplied from uh, Iran, that, 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 that whatever's being done there to block naval resupply 
or maritime resupply of missiles to, to the Houthi area seems to be working. So they're having to curtail their, their attack. So I would have said, you know, they could try and increase their attacks by the Houthis in the Red Sea. I'm not sure if that's really one of the things they can still do. There may not be enough ammunition for them, so to speak, to maintain or to increase the current operational tempo that the Houthis have in that regard. I want to talk a little bit more about Hezbollah. So uh, as Iran prepares for revenge, as you were just discussing, its proxy group Hezbollah in Lebanon, it's basically issued an ultimatum. Uh, the Hindustan Times reports that the head of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, has declared that the group is fully prepared for war with Israel. Um, in a direct threat to Bibi Netanyahu, uh, he said that Hezbollah has not yet used its, quote, main weapons against the IDF. This might be a good time to remind our audience, Hal, what is Hezbollah capable of? It's a different foe than Hamas. Well, it's a much more capable foe. They have a lot more troops. They could send, uh, you know, uh, 70, 100,000, you know, possibly uh, troops. I, mean, I don't think they could marshal that to send them down uh, in any any organized way. Uh, and and I think what if you look at what Israel's done up north, they have moved a lot of forces to the north as they were as they especially as they were consolidating their positions in Gaza. They moved a lot of forces up north to be ready for something that Hezbollah might do. So in that regard, they do have capabilities on the ground. Uh, but their main capability is, is you know, to some extent with drones, but to a larger extent with missiles. And, and that's that phenomenal missile spray, all of it supplied by Iran, which they could rain down all over Israel, the entire country. And and they do have enough missiles to, to more than overwhelm the Iron Dome defensive capability. So that's their main weapon. Now, I, I just want to put a word of caution out there. You know, um, uh, Hezbollah and overarching uh, rhetorical flourish or kind of uh, symbiotic relationship. They they will commonly say things like, "Oh, we're gonna, you know, a full war. This is a uh, you know a jihad, meaning a, a, like a holy war. Then then they're going to dedicate themselves to the destruction of Israel." And, and they will often say this stuff. And then you and you actually look at their actions. And uh, their actions don't really match their words. Uh, their words tend to be pretty far out there, and their actions tend to be uh, a lot more, dare I use the word, conservative in terms of what they actually do on the ground or what they do in the air. So when I hear Nasrallah's son uh, saying something like that, I, I don't. I take a little bit of grain of salt on that. I'm not ruling out that they might do something, but uh, then again, I'm I'm dubious that they want to trigger something which they know could potentially lead to the destruction of Hezbollah by the Israeli Defense Forces. All right, Hal, we'll leave it there for now. Six months of war tomorrow. Uh, we will talk soon. We will keep watching uh, to see any major developments, especially any potential response from Iran. Take care, Hal. All right, you too, Austin.